Um, yeah, so I'm from, uh, my main job is the Royal Danish Ca Academy of Fine Arts School of Design in Copenhagen. Uh, we run a master program in visual game and media design, so if anybody's interested in, in that. Um, my main job is as a kind of video game theorist, and so I realized in a way that what I tend to do is do a kind of switch. Like sometimes I'm interested in kind of very high level general abstract theory about video games, and then sometimes I'm interested in, say, like more concretely what's happening, say, historically. So I've been writing these very general books like Half Real and the Art of Failure, and then I wrote A Casual Revolution about casual games, and now I'm pretty interested in kind of independent and experimental games. And so I think that, to me, one of the things that can be really, really kind of fascinating is to think of what happens when you think on a very kind of general philosophical level and have that kind of meet, think of that, how that concretely kind of plays out, say, in a post on an internet forum or, say, in the way that Unity 3D by default smooths its textures to signal that they weren't expecting you to make pixelated experimental games. And so what follows then is a kind of example of this. I'm trying to in, interested in think of like this idea of how, when we ask the question, what is a game? How does it actually play out concretely in game culture right now? So if we think of a game like, uh, like Dear Esther. So Dear Esther obviously was often kind of, in a way, it originally criticized for being, being, being a walking simulator. And so, so that was meant to be a, a kind of criticism saying that it lacked uh, most of the things you kind of expect in a game such as kind of, kind of challenge or gameplay and this was somehow kind of a detriment. And of course, all right, so of course what the, the way the game works is you, you walk around this island and then you're given various bits of narrative information. And so then Pinchbeck, who wrote the game, one of the creators of the game, was very kind of disturbed by the fact that some people thought of it as being a not game, right? And so saying that he think of this, thinks of this as being a way of kind of people try to also kind of protect the status quo in some way. Um, but interestingly, there's a, a kind of very positive review talks about that Dear Esther, in a way, is great because of the fact that it's not a video game, that it somehow kind of breaks beyond the boundaries of what we think of as, as being a game. Um, similarly, uh, you can think of a game like uh, uh, Depression Quest. So now this is like the, the Cursor Quest. There we go. Um, where I think there's something that's been brewing uh, lately, which is a conflict over that word called game, right? So it's not uncommon to see player comments like this, say on, on Steam or in forums, where somebody rejects something new on the premise that somehow it's not a game or not a real game. And so here's somebody writing about a Depression Quest, the Zoe Quinn's game, saying, I can't really call it a game since I don't think the point is to entertain you. Uh, so obviously there are many kind of dimensions to this the question of this particular game, and, and many people have, have uh, kind of addressed the question of, of, of gender very kind of eloquently. Um, but I think, then it, it, I think often what you get is a kind of simple solution, right? So in a way it seems if we only got rid of that word game, we'd never have any kind of problems anymore. And so at the DIGRA conference in Germany 2015, I thought that was actually a co quite a common sentiment, this idea that if we just didn't talk about games or game definitions, then we'd, we'd all be fine, everything would be, be, be great. And in a way, it's possible to make a, a kind of very a nice argument, right? And the nice argument goes like this. So who cares if it's a game, right? So isn't it more the fact that we should be allowed to make whatever we want? So if something is, or if it seems to be it's sold as, or if it's promoted as, or understood as, or understood by something as, or misunderstood as a game, or not understood as a game, or belonging to a world in which everything is a game, or in a, a world in which games don't really exist, like who cares, right? Shouldn't we just be allowed to make what's good and not care what it is? Why should we care what people think it's called? Aren't categories in some way just weird acts of violence that we inflict upon ourselves Something that, something that we use to limit ourselves. So really, shouldn't we just throw off the shackles of this narrow category and just make whatever we want? And so let's say if we could do this, then we can do, we can do anything, right? So, so let's play a great game. So the winner uh, is the one that transfer, makes, tra makes the largest transfer to my PayPal account uh, this and uh, during the talk. And at the end, I'll kind of do a tally. and. Uh, Perhaps there is a prize. Perhaps will I return a very large sum of money or not? There's only one way to find out. So 
Well, okay, so that's probably weird in some way. This is not usually what we, what, what we think of as, as a regular game. And similarly, it seems that it's nice to have this idea we can do anything, but so here's my next submission for indicator IGF, right? So, which is Microsoft uh, Excel. And so, so you can see it's a, it's a great argument, this, this thing about we should get r getting rid of the word game, but it has a problem, which is that we don't really think that anything goes, right? So it seems we do care. We don't just accept anything. And this is important because we often have heated issues around this question of what is a game. In a way, it seems we want to say that we accept anything, but we don't really. And so, of course, we actually have lots of controversies in games concerning this question. So we talk as if we don't care, but it turns out we do. There was a big controversy on this a few years back. So uh, Anna Anthropy's very great game, uh, Dysphoria, um, was kind of described by Raph Koster as something that where most of it could be built in PowerPoint and isn't a game. And Costa's argument was that this wasn't really a value judgment. He thought it was a great piece of art, but it probably wasn't a game in his opinion. And I of you made this game, actually took, took it very, very personally and said, well, that's not a value judgment. In a way, that when, you, when you reject something as being not a game, what you're doing is you're upholding the status quo and you're kind of rejecting certain things of being kind of included in games, being discussed as games. So saying something isn't a game is just a way to kind of maintain that all video games are really about bald space marines and we don't want anything else. Um, making a really even stronger version of that argument, argument, Robert Yang said that in a way if you argue that personal games don't really fit a formal definition of game, there's a kind of leap to saying that the people who make these games don't really fit a formal definition of people. So in, in a way it's saying that it has kind of very strong political implications to say that something isn't a game. And so one thing I thought was kind of interesting about this is like, <laughs> I was thinking that, that there's an interesting uh, argument to made, made if you think of Judith Butler, right? So that um, the fact is that actually, we actually tend to care deeply about what is a game and what isn't a game, or about the label game. And, and Anthropy also cared deeply about that label. And so it's not that we should just get rid of the category of game, but that we should think about how we use that category. Um, so. Um, I think there's a kind of common idea that in a way categories are always bad. Uh, but I think we can think of uh, <laughs> Judith Butler here. So she talks about this thing that it's not simply that we can just get rid of, say, categories like man and woman, because actually we spend a lot of time performing these categories. Many people care deeply about, say, performing as a man or performing as a woman. So and I think in the same way we can say that many of us use the word game to say what we're trying to do or to, to say something particular, to try something particular. It's not that we don't care about that category called, called game, it's actually that's something we use all the time both to make things. Um, and I think, I'm sure some of you think I'm overthinking this a bit, but it's actually pretty concrete, right? So if, you, if you're pr sitting down in front of Unity 3D, you're open, opening a kind of visual studio, you're programming in C sharp, you're actually making a decision, like are you making a game, are you making a musical toy, are you making a utility? And we use this to kind of explain to ourselves what we do, to explain to others what we do. And we also say to ourselves then, well, I'm making this thing, I'll put it out in this world as a game. And this means a few things. It also means like where does, it end, where does this end up in Steam? Where does this end up in the App Store? Like what's the icon supposed to look like? It also means a lot of things for how people are going to approach it. So it also works on a psychological level. So if I, I tell you to take this test, you're going to be approaching it in one way. On the other hand, if I tell you to play this game, you're going to, going to be approaching it in a different way. So one of the, well, some of the studies done on this say that say people who are likely to self-handicap, say, say if you're the kind of student who kind of get drunk the evening before you have exams, uh, in order to not, to not feel too bad about failing. Um, if you have that kind of like, personality, then being told that something is a game is actually going to make you le less likely to self-handicap than if you're told it's a test. So um, it means that actually people use that word game kind of very concretely. It means a lot for how you're going to approach something. Similarly, you can also think of how the associations of what a game is actually change over time. Um, so, if you think of the, the kind of twine games that are being made these days, such as Howling Dogs, a lot of these are kind of very personal um, games, often about kind of fragmented identity. And people who make twine games are usually very adamant that these are, are games. Um, of course, the weird thing is that twine games are in many ways quite similar to 
uh, what was called hypertext fictions, like of the late 1980s and early 1990s in something called story space. But at that time, when people were making these things, they were very adamant that these were absolutely not games. Like this was the last thing they would want the things to be described as. So, well, what changed? And why, is that, why, why do people want their things to be called games now in a way they didn't, say, like 30 years ago? And I think it seems that at the time, it was obviously, say, like in 1987, that a game was something kind of unserious. And if you wanted to do something serious, it would be have to like an interactive thingy of some sort. Um, and now today the game category is much more positive, right? You have, have, you have places you can go if you make a game, right? You might be able to get funding. You might be able to like, put your game in a festival. There may, may be interesting kind of blogs or even academics who want to write about your experimental game. So suddenly the game category has just become much more valuable. And so this is a, another game called uh, Proteus. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you have played uh, Proteus, but this is kind of another kind of interesting take on the word game, right? So um, we see a lot of people who are trying to, in a way, make something they call games, but they're also trying to fix games. So Proteus is a game that doesn't have a kind of official goal the way you would expect it to do, to, to, to have. So it's more a game, again, like a walking simulator of sorts, but more in a kind of poetic sense. You're walking around the world, experiencing like the visuals and the sound. But at the same time, you again, you, you again get this thing where some players will say, well, as far as I can tell, this literally has no point other than to walk around. Somebody, some people don't like this kind of game or don't think of it as being a proper game. On the other hand, the developer emphasizes how this was really made by a game developer in the context of video games using game design tools and so on. Therefore, it is a game, which if, if you follow these kind of things, it's a kind of institutional definition of games, right? So it's because it's made by game people in game institutions, then clearly it is a, it is a game. Um, and so, in my first book, Half Real, I tried to define what I call the classic game model to kind of des describe the idea of what a game is and how that may change over time. And uh, you can think of the awkwardness of the PayPal game is the fact that you don't expect games to like, be straightforwardly about like just putting in money uh, without some kind of at least without at least without some kind of system like you have in poker. Uh, you can also think of like how how something like, like Proteus is strange because it doesn't tell you what's good or bad, so what I'd call kind of valorization of outcome or goal. It doesn't say what you're supposed to do. It doesn't, doesn't give you points for it. And you can think of something like Dysphoria or, or Dear Esther are kind of strange in the ways that they don't have much of player effort and also in the way that, say, if you complete the game, it's not as much, you don't feel necessarily that much kind of pride in it. It's not like you, you can go around saying, I beat Dear Esther or I beat dysphoria would be a very strange thing to say. So there's some of the kind of personal investment in completing the game that you don't have in these situations. Um, this also means that you kind of have to think about what, what we, do we actually mean when we say like we define games. And it turns out there, there are kind of a number of different types of definitions. So a philosopher called Anil Gupta talks about the idea of the, the kind of g g definition that tries to account for the way, say, the way everybody has been using the word game ever you want to make a definition that in, com combines all of that, or you might have definitions where you don't care about how other people use the word game. You say, well, you're all wrong. This is how it's supposed to be. Um, and this is what I'm doing here. It's for much, much more what he calls an explicative definition, definition, which is saying I'm not really caring about necessarily how everybody has been using the word, and I'm not saying that nobody can use the word in other ways. I'm just saying that this is a way of looking at how games have been working up, up till now, and it, it's a, something that allows us to talk about how games change. Similarly, you can think of uh, um, a, a company, a group like Tale of Tales. So one of the things they like to do, they had this not games initiative, which was interesting. They talked about they don't want to make games with rules and goals and so on. Um, and they call this the, the not games initiative. But interestingly, even though they wanted to make not games, they would still go to game festivals and, and sell their things in, 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 in the kind of game channel or the game category on, on Steam, for example. Um, and so one of the ways to think about this is that there's, there, there are a lot of kind of definitions of art. So Noel Carroll has an interesting one, which is to say that art is what kind of builds on or rejects the art tradition. So, um, 
Of course, the kind of most famous example is something like, like uh, uh, Duchamp's uh, urinal, uh, which obviously kind of rejects the tradition of art, but of course very quickly became canonized. It's almost like a, kind of the definition of art by now, right? Or something like Rierkrit Tiervanius' way of, of making uh, Thai food in galleries. And so these are obviously also, in, a way, in, a way, in the same way that a lot, a lot of the games I talked about are strange or weird or kind of break our expectations, these also break our expectations for what art is supposed to be. But then you under, you're suppo supposed to, as audience, uh, understand this, right? You understand that this is strange in many ways, but then you're also under, supposed to understand that this kind of relates to, say, like, kind of futurism or Gordon Matter Clark and so on. You are, you're supposed to understand that even though it kind of rejects the art tradition, it's also something that kind of builds on it or extends it. Um, of course, you can also do like the ultimate mani manifesto. This is Darius Casimi's uh, Fuck Video Games Manifesto, where he says, well, he doesn't really like video games at all. He'd, he'd just rather do kind of Twitter bots and other kinds of software. And he kind of did stick with this for a while. But you can think of something like Jody's works where they use game technology, but it's not really meant to be kind of playable as such. And it's not something you show at, at, at game festivals, it's much more something you show at, at galleries. And so in a way you can kind of sum it up, there are kind of different ways of, of rejecting games, right? So you can say like reject the conventions, but you can still kind of assert that it actually is a game. Or you can reject conventions, you would say, well, this is not a game, but you still go to kind of game venues. You can reject ga conventions, and then you can say, well, it's not a game, it's art, and then you can, you can show it in art venues instead. Um, something, someone like Jason Rohrer does kind of, he, he, he rejects conventions, but then he frames this as, game and kind of, as a game and a kind of art in a kind of very general sense. And then, of course, you can just reject games and do something entirely different and work somewhere else. And so why is that important? Why, why do people do this? Well, they do this because they use the word game strategically, like, so who do you want your friends to be? Like, where do you want your work, where do you want your work to be shown? And so, what I want to say by saying this is that I think there's a widespread misunderstanding that somehow if we talk about con conventions or definitions that, or that if you ask what a game is, we're somehow limiting ourselves. Uh, but I think that's actually wrong, it's actually the other way around. So that when we ask this question, what is a game, it's actually very productive. So it helps us understand when somebody is complaining that something is not new, that something new is not a game, what are they actually trying to say by that? You, we can think of what is the kind of resistance that's, that's going on here. Uh, we can also see when, say, like Sims or Sim Cities go from being weird software toys to obviously games as they are now. We can think of how that category, how the word game changes meaning over time. Um, and so finally, also, I think this works, this is often an exercise I do with students, but kind of think about, like, we talk about what are the kind of expectations we have for, say, downloadable games on Steam, like, what would, what would be really strange in, in this situation? So actually think about, thinking about conventions or thinking about definitions is something that allows us to point to new things that can be made. And so I think this is, this is why it's so productive to think about this, this question, like, what is a game? As long as you understand what it is, you're actually asking. So in a way, like, so who cares if it's a game? Well, it does turn out that we all do. Like, games are really a kind of imperfect category. Like, it's not you, can do, you can't do a definition of games that everybody will agree with. But at the same time, we all have a kind of investment in that word. And so it's a word for controlling expectations, so selecting friends, selecting where you want your work to go, where you want it to be shown, how you want people to approach it. And in a way to understand the expectations we have for games is also to understand like the art form, right? So to, to make games and to play games is also to play up against these conventions. And so I think that's why it's so important to ask these naive questions such as like, what is a game? Because it allows us to think on a very high level, very abstract level about what's happening with games right now. So I think it's just always important to be able to kind of connect the general to the concrete. But we just always need to do it the right way. So I think it's very important for us to to think about and to understand the expectations in game culture without trying to enforce them at the same time. And so that's it. So I just want us to say we care about if it's a game, right? But we shouldn't let that let, let limit us. So what I really hope you can do is you can all kind of go forth and make weird games or whatever you want to make. And so that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you.